Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you all so much for joining us. My name is Danny Reed, and I'm the Education Director at the Holocaust Memorial in Miami Beach, Florida. And on behalf of the Miami Jewish Film Festival and the Miami uh, community, I just want to welcome you all to uh, this year's film festival. Obviously, this year we're doing it uh, not in person because of uh, the circumstances that we all find ourselves uh, living in for the past year. But uh, I'm, I'm really appreciative that all of you were able to join us. And I want to talk about this, uh, this film, which has uh, so many layers. And uh, I, I suppose, you know, I'm going to, you know, Gina, if I can, if I can ask you first. Uh, an ocean behind her. <laughs> I'm she's, in Oregon. Out, she's got a wonderful, she's in Oregon. But uh, Gina, I want to ask you, because I, and I saw the film and I was looking on, uh, on YouTube, of course, for anything else. And I saw a, uh, a video of, uh, of you and Rafal from several years ago talking mm -hmm. about this movie, about how you, you've been trying for, for years to, uh, to bring it to the screen. So, and you finally did. Can, can you talk a little bit about, like, uh, uh, for the audience of uh, what gave you this idea? Because I originally thought it was also a, a, probably based on a book. I was surprised to find it was an original yeah. screenplay. So if you, can you speak about- Well, uh, simply, I, um, I started in Hollywood writing sitcoms at Columbia. And anybody that knows uh, how Hollywood, um, the area, it's the Columbia studio at Sunset Gower. Um, many days I would take a break and walk through the Jewish cemetery, which is where we filmed a beautiful park cemetery and I would walk there and wondered about the people. Um, nobody I knew was buried there. My family's not from the West. And, um, but it occurred to me, what would, what are the, the, what tragedies have befallen? And what, what would my spirit be like were I one of them? And that's where the, the origin came and I knew Raphael because I was a playwright before I did sitcoms and he saw one of my plays and made it into a movie and he saw the script and then it was years years since well I wrote it in 91 I think the script and I think it also was you know, I was married then and to um you know being from Miami Beach in New York I really didn't come across that much um, anti-Semitism until I got married. And I married a very pretty boy, no longer, but very, I mean, he may still be pretty, but we're not married, um, from the, um, from Harrisburg, which I did not think was like a big racist place. And his family had never met a Jew and I was just shocked. It was really one of my first times of going, wow. <laughs> and that all kind of happened around the same time. Mm -hmm. And if I can ask uh, Rafal, uh, what what was it that spoke to you about uh, the script after uh, Gina gave you the script? Well, when I read it, I was I was so, just so moved. I mean, I was moved into tears, and it, I just choked up. Like every every few pages, I would just start crying. It touched me so deeply because it's there's so much you know love and compassion in these characters. I mean, these two, these are such wonderful characters you know, um, Samuel, who has such unconditional love to this girl and he suffered so much pain. And this girl who is such an interesting character. I mean, she's troubled, you know, she's from a broken family, but yet she's hurting for love, you know? So there's so much love in this script. And it stuck with me because I would try to get this movie made over and over and over and over. And each time I read it, I would be, I would start crying and be moved to tears. It like would never, and, you know, I would never get jaded by it. So that's the power of it that I found is that there is, it has such deep emotions that, that never die. I mean, I could read the script right now tomorrow and I'll still break into tears and cry like I read it for the first time. And it's very rare to find that in a script, you know, in a movie. And it has so many beautiful things about forgiveness, you know, unconditional love, you know, um, uniting two opposites, racial groups, you know, it applies, I think, to the whole world, not only to Jews and not Jews, but it applies to 
you know, people from all around the world. It's very universal and it doesn't date. I mean, this script, when I read it in the 90s, it was just as relevant as it is today. Even it, it, its relevance never changes. And I think that's the sign of a classic script. So I just love this film, this script. And, you know, I was, I'm very honored that Gina gave it to me, you know, and, uh, you know, I mean, she, she put her baby that she, and this is, she claims one of her best scripts, that, the best script that she cares the most about. And she gave it into my hands, you know, and I'm very honored and was very grateful to have the chance to be able to make it into a movie. You know, and I'm so sorry that my apologies that we had so little money. You know, I know it deserved a very big treatment. It deserved millions of dollars. But in the end, it had to be done in a very humble way with a million compromises. But I don't think it has lost its power, nevertheless. So um, what, what uh, film company finally gave you the green light? Yes, it's, like after it's, so um, long. Yes, well, finally, it was picked up by, um, I, I have to pronounce the name correctly, Gina. It's Ma Mishi, uh, Neil Friedman, and I can never pronounce the name correctly. Ma Mishima films. They specialize in Jewish and, you know, uh, and Israeli films. And um, they, they, ha they are like the niche distributor, the boutique distributor for this film. And right. I think they're the ideal distributor because they have a, they would they would play it in synagogues in 1500 synagogues before you know getting it out on hopefully netflix or hbo so they will do a real grassroots rollout and they will play all the jewish film festivals right and also branch out to christian and other groups so i think they're the perfect boutique distributor who will treat this film with great love and care and make sure that it gets out into the world and it will have some theatrical release in certain cities, New York, probably Miami. I mean, in, the, in Florida, in New York and the Chicago area and hopefully in other parts of the country. That is great, that is great. Now, obviously you assembled your team and I do wanna uh, question uh, Mark and uh, Helga, uh, obviously, but I, I must turn to, uh, to Ed Asner because in assembling your team, you're assembling your, your, um, your team that's gonna create the film, but also part of that is, is the cast. Um, Mr. Asner, first of all, it's a pleasure. It's an honor to, uh, to meet you, even though it's via the screen. But, uh, but let's ask you as an actor, uh, what was it about uh, this role that, uh, that spoke with you when you were, when you were shown the script? It was a, a powerful script. It uh, was a beautiful script. It showed two worlds and uh, their conflict and uh, their merger. Um, it had a lot for me to do. And uh, I tried my best, uh, unfortunately, it didn't satisfy everybody. Uh, but uh, as we Ed, said, how can you say that? Everyone loves it. No one was dissatisfied. Everyone loved your performance. He's so the, humble. The girl, she's the star of the film. She should certainly be the first one to speak. Why isn't she here? She is um, in a complicated spot now. Oh, what? And uh, it's hard to say. I think she's still mourning and she is um, really going through something. Morning or she is terrific. You know, you know um, she, her father died, you know, her father died in an aeroplane accident just a year ago. She loved him so much. And, um, and now, you know, she says, you know, I don't know if I want to do movies. This was so, such a complicated thing. I want to focus on going to college. So, which is a very honorable thing. You know, she's become very shy. Well, I, I, I understand because of the that. Dead. Yeah, I understand well, that, uh, that she was very young, that she was... Uh, 14. Um, she was yeah, 13. yeah. Fourteen. She was fourteen years old, so and you know she, so really... she's actually younger than I thought she was. She gave a yeah. very uh, uh, powerful performance, and you know it was very interesting to see uh, Ed and and her and the and the the uh, the interplay between the two of them was that Rafael was that easy or or difficult to uh, to do. No. 
No, it, they, they actually were so wonderful together. You know, I, I, I brought them together at Ed's house. I brought Margot and she, she read a couple of scenes and they just became the characters. And then I asked them to walk together. And there was just so, something so moving and so touching seeing them walk back and forth just in silence. You know, Ed was, she was helping Ed, you know, and just seeing the frailty of Ed and this, this sort of hurt, you know, girl who is, you know, with so, so much pain and tenderness and how she, you know, just the two of them, the chemistry, that magic of them walking together just sold it to me. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, and they were just amazing. And, and, you know, we just completely discovered her out of the blue. I was at a casting session with my son on a commercial and I saw her sitting like in the lobby, you know, of this office. And I just saw her eyes and she's got these, uh, I don't know, the, the piercing, beautiful, intense eyes. And I was just drawn to these eyes. And I told, and I said, the mom, you know, is your daughter an actor? She says, well, she's learning to be an actor. She's trying to be. I said, uh, we're shooting a photo shoot for this movie. I want to raise money to make. Can we use her and dress her up as this, you know, teenage runaway girl and to take some shots of her downtown? So I got a photographer and a week later we go and we shoot and she was very much in the character you know and then I said you know what you should why didn't you audition for this why didn't you read the script I sent this her the script and then the casting director brought like hundreds of girls you know and 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 I said well listen there's this girl who I did a photo shoot with for the you know for promoting this project let her read and the casting director was like so like oh no never 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 like this is a joke you know how can you bring someone and she came in and she completely blew us away I mean she was like tears were flowing and you know it was also Ed's presence on the set she he, you were very generous with her she was comfortable because of how I won't say mentor because that's too simple a word she really needed I mean it was her first acting gig. And she, you know, she told me that as long as Ed was in the scene, she felt very, very safe and comfortable. By that little stinker. Yeah, she's something, <laughs> she's an amazing yeah. girl too. Very complicated family, you know, when I say complicated, I don't mean it, that's not the right word. Very textured family, you know, they're European and, um, you know, she's not she's not your typical 14 year old Hollywood kid that is for sure right and, and I, know, I think that different. that really did come off uh, and, because I thought she was old a much older uh, person playing a younger uh, yeah she a has a much person. older soul and I don't know Gina are we allowed to reveal the secret that she revealed to us in the audition or not no, no, I mean, no that's okay. for her to say. Of course right, not. okay. That's her. Anyway, anyway, she has a complicated yeah. background, which is complicated and interesting. And I think that's one of the things that attracted me to her because I thought mm -hmm. those complications actually were the character. I, and I, I encourage her. She feels her to, deeply. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that's yeah. great. Yeah, some of the, the scenes towards the end of the movie after she realizes that uh, um, Ed's character is, is passing that whole transition where she decides to, I guess, you know, as you put it, embrace the, embrace the tiger, you know, was, was very well done with some of the best scenes in the movie, I thought. Um, Thank you. But I, I also have to say about Ed, you know, I mean, Ed was amazing, you know, here, you know, Ed is 91 and he, he just gave it everything, you know, and, and at such a age, you know, he's, he's such a brilliant mind. You can talk to him about any subject, you know, He's so fascinating and so interesting and so lucid. And he, he was there like late into the hours, you know, as we were shooting and he was tired and we we're so worried about him, you know. Oh God, he wasn't that like, tired. Margot yeah, said to and, me, and he was, has he, more he energy just, than me. He, he believed in this tired. movie and he gave it all, you know, he gave yeah. it all and, and we're so grateful to him. And, um, well, it, you know, it's interesting as somebody who deals with Holocaust survivors, on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, we have survivors that that volunteer at the memorial, and we're involved in uh, um, in, in helping them and using them as as uh, to educate uh, students. You know, I, I've I've come across, you know, survivors usually do fall into either they bury everything and they move forward, um, 
or some that are very broken, but learn how to, how to live with it. And Ed was able to convey that, that, uh, that sense of, of brokenness, yet you still have to, uh, you still have to embrace life. You still have to live uh, um, at, as fulfilling a life as you're able. Well, that's what I think Ed was able to manage because yeah. many actors wouldn't find that delicate strand of light that was still left in them. Right. And, and that actors wouldn't have that, um, I don't know if you'd call subtlety or knowledge of how to keep it, you know, it wasn't, he was never um, broken like Steiger was in The Pawnbreaker, but could have been but he didn't let himself, you know? He was right. never that dark. But Correct. Yeah. were it not for she, I don't know if he would have found the light. Mm -hmm. I mean, but you I, think I that, Ed? Like, to... if you hadn't met her, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. Right. But I, but I would like to hear more from Ed. We're so honored yeah. that Ed has joined us, and it's so rare that we get this chance. So, Ed, please, say anything you want to say. We want to hear more. Well... I thought it was a beautiful script. I thought she, out of the clear blue, turned out to be the right ticket. And uh, we told our story. Uh, we had uh, uh, disruption, which we had to sail over or skip over. And um, we did our best. Uh, LA is filled with Jews, so we had an easy market. And um, we draw upon them to uh, depict the, the plight, their flight, their height, <laughs> uh, was a, a very easy thing to do with what we had to choose from. Yeah, regarding disruptions, what Ed is yeah. referring to, at one time, the Screen Actors Guild shut us down because we were so low budget and so understaffed. There was not enough security. And I had Ed walking on buses and trains and streets, uh -huh. and they were very concerned about him. So we had to apologize to the Guild and make sure we have enough assistance, you know, and, they, and Ed had to write a letter. And here is Ed, the ex-president of the Screen Actors Guild had so, to write a letter, please, can you let us continue making this wonderful film? So then but we what, got what I, but, but my assumption is, is that uh, in terms of cinematography, and I understand the it's original soundtrack, which uh, which I love, by the way, Mark, but uh, what were some of the challenges that you uh, confronted in, in trying to get the right, the right atmosphere for this film? Um, well, I guess the... A film on with this with this um, ambition and the limited resources, I guess, always has its, its challenges in in on that side, I guess, mainly. Um, which also, you know, sometimes the those limited resources can also, you know, create a language that, in the end, is is very truthful and very appropriate for the subject matter. Which in this case it was and. I think our approach to be real and be human and be subjective, letting things happen, letting the human element be the main the main focus in the frame, and it it helps. Though there was no no chance to really veer off into technical adventures or overlight things or. It was it was a very natural human approach, which I think um, um, really helped in the end. Um, which is what we did. It was I think it was the whole film was handheld. I think there was nothing on sticks. It was all um, very very much trying to be part of of the human element that was unfolding in front of the the camera. Which which I think it was the right approach and. It, even though the approach was given to us and it, it really it really fit and I feel like it it really complemented the narrative. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny that you mentioned that everything was hand, handheld because that was actually going to be my next question because there was this fluidity to how, uh, how all the scenes were shot. So I guess that, that lent itself to it. Mark, I do want to ask you as the, as the composer, um, 
was it uh, was it solely your choice? Because it seemed like most of the um, most of what you composed was electronic, or that uh, that subtle, um, almost Moog synthesizer kind of uh, kind of music. Was that purposeful, or or why did you choose, well, or choose that? Essentially, uh, Raphael called me and sent me a scene, the scene where Ed is in the cemetery the first time he kisses his wife's grave. And I thought the performance there and the timing, the way, the way time elapsed, the way Ed confidently just took his, which I guess is pure experience, he, he, he paced it in a way that was completely, was perfect. And, um, and essentially, that moment of silence that the character affords that kiss had to be respected. And so I sent Raphael the, my, my demo back um, where I didn't fill that gap. I didn't fill that space because the actor had actually wanted it to be a, a reflective. So essentially, I think Raphael liked that approach. And so when we discussed uh, how we should approach it, um, th there were a lot of things because the story was so clear and because Mr. Asner was inhabiting that character with so much aplomb and calm and his pacing was so, so, how can I put it? it he was owning these moments and the girl, the, 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 the young actress was really, you know, playing it well. She was, she was in the moments that he paced in a way, as far as, uh, fr from my perspective as a, as a right. composer. So we had yeah, to take Ed a- Yeah, set the tempo. Yes, he set the tempo completely. And, but, she, but she managed to inhabit this uh -huh. without, without flailing. I mean, she, she was alive all through that, even though it was not her tempo. And in a way, so at least from my perspective, that's where it was. So Mr. Asner, if you have another comment about that, it's, it's completely uh, fine, but-, but um, so as a result, with, with Raphael, we decided in order to give the story a little bit of shape and because we didn't have the means that perhaps we would have on other productions, uh, we decided that all the scenes that Ed was, you know, the protagonist in, the main protagonist in, should be scored with something that is more akin to an acoustic uh, instrument. So, but it had to be very minimal. We mm -hmm. couldn't we couldn't infringe on that space because everything was handled with a lot of calm. I mean, it was, it, you know, everything was paced a certain way. So if you come in and you burst with a uh, music, it's an awful, it's an awful uh, <laughs> sort of a hijacking of, of, of what the performance is. So we stayed very minimal. And um, a, lot of the, a lot of what Raphael wanted was underlying uh, sort of, padding under the dialogue because the dialogue was loaded with what Ed's motive was for behaving that way. The whole thing behind, you know, the tiger notion that you embrace the tiger. So, um, so that's what we tried to do. And then um, a lot of songs came in for the parts where Ed was absent and the sort of girl half, the, the girl's okay. half of the, of the film. So a lot of song appeared. And once those songs had been placed, uh, that's completely between Raphael and, and other people. Uh, once those choices had been made, we came back in and we put a little bit of, um, of, that, of that sort of synthesizer based thing, which was a little more sort of attached to the girl. There's one more thing that's gonna happen. We had a, we had a strings played in New York uh, you know, in this Zoom world. Uh, and, uh, and so the strings are yet to be put in um, on the very long uh, cue at the end. Uh, so you saw it uh, with the first set of strings and uh, there's, a, there's a new set of strings coming, but we kept, we kept it, it seemed, I mean, I tend to like to connect to the performance of the, of the actors, so, right. and, and some other elements, but because there was such a human element to the image, uh, which Heige just uh, pinpointed, you know, it's, it's, it, it, there was something there was, there was no, it would have been completely out of sync to try and heighten this in some way. We had to remain 
Right. We were very careful not to overdo the music, not to yeah. kill the beauty and the power of the emotion between the actors. Yeah. Right. But I want to hear more from Ed. Ed. Well, I can I just to... say something about Ed first? Yes. And then, of course, I want some of my favorite moments in the in the film. They weren't in the script. It's when Ed ad lived and Ed. I just want to thank you for that. When you ad lived after the Nazis, you know, after the neo kids were spraying, you know, before the fight and your elephant run, you know, there was a comfort. It takes confidence, I suppose, as an actor to just delve into the character so much that you can use your own words. But I just want to thank you for that. I never did. Oh, I am delighted to hear that I gratified you. <laughs> Okay, that's all I have to say right there. Okay, please, Ed. <laughs> well, let's, let's hear let's, Ed. Yeah, well, Ed, can I ask you? Let, let's let's uh, add on, uh, add on to that uh, that compliment. How much uh, um, for the for you for the process of creating this film for you? Um, um, was it straight? You know, straight just do the script, or how much discussion was there with you in terms of? what how you felt a, a certain scene should go no I, I i didn't do any directing i uh i brought the girl along as gently and as decently as i could and uh we had a a nice relationship uh the um the elements of um of uh the uh, the tiger uh, we're all left to Raphael and uh, I and Gina, and uh, I uh, I was born in '29, and my life has been punctuated by moments of the Holocaust, both from relatives and from history, so that um, I'm one of the testaments to the Holocaust, and uh, I just tried to do my job. Well, you know, Rafael said that one of the main, uh, um, and I think Gina would agree, that one of the main uh, uh, themes of this movie is, is forgiveness, forgiveness and, and redemption. Um, how did that, did that, how did that theme uh, resonate with you and, and affect your performance? It did not dominate me. I, I, I let the words speak for themselves and did what I had to do. Uh, I, I mean, look, look at the world today. Germany is a leader in terms of human rights. Mm -hmm of, of uh, forestalling tragedy again. It's turned completely 180 degrees. So the example of Germany embodies what the film has to say. They embraced their tiger and they, they defanged it. It's that Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe, maybe I could, maybe I could quickly just uh, add one thing because I think this is the right moment. Uh, when I saw that first that first couple of scenes that Raphael sent me and I saw um, Ed's performance in, in them, uh, I knew I was gonna do, I was gonna do the film um, because it was, you know, it wasn't gonna be uh, anyone else uh, playing with that. Um, it, <laughs> it was just too good. It was just too good and it was too much, there, there's too much I don't know. It was just extremely eloquent to me, and 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 uh, yeah. I mean, that was so. That's what. Yeah. That was the factor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really, I really believe now. I truly know that Ed is the only person who could have played this movie. Honestly, I mean, his, his performance is so subtle and so powerful, yeah. and so there's so, so much lo love, you know, uh, in in everything that he put and. This, and if, and the chemistry between them, there's no other actor in the world today who could play this role as well as Ed has played. And you know, I'm, I'm, I was just so honored and, and and amazed, you know, how Ed just became this character from the second he walked on the set. 
He was Samuel. It was just so touching. Just seeing him sitting on a park bench, reading a newspaper. I mean, just like, I was like, it just brought me to tears, you know. The silences were even more powerful than, 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 the, than some of, you know, they were just as powerful as the dialogue. And just to see him walk and struggle and walk, you know, was just so touching. And we were so worried he was going to fall and topple and, you know, get another hip surgery. We were just, and he was such a trooper. I mean, honestly, he was just. Raphael, he was yeah. as strong as any of us. He had yeah, I mean, he's, I mean, in okay, 91, so don't he's say like, that. Yeah, he's a he titan. He had full energy. Danny, yeah. can I say something that's more direct to your audience? Sure. Please? Go right ahead. After I wrote this, I I had no idea that we would be, I, I mean, I wasn't directly affected by the Holocaust, to my knowledge. I haven't done an ancestry thing, but I never thought we'd enter a Trump period. And I never thought that this level of racism would be so not only tolerated, but encouraged and um, prized. And what I wanted to do when I wrote this, I knew at a certain age when Hollywood and I would be drifting, um, that I wanted to, I want, and I do want to, so if anybody has better ideas than I as to how to do this, the mechanics of it, I want, I, the hatred starts early. And I want to go to high schools in Ohio and in Pennsylvania, Montana, where, where the hate groups are, where the, and I want to go to the high schools and, you know, like assembly where they show films they, like they did when we were kids, you know, eighth grade seniors that, and, and show them the film and they won't change that day, but that's where the hate begins because their parents tell them. So that's just, if anybody has great ideas for that, that's what I'd like to do. Margaret. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and I, I do not want uh, to, you know, um, get off the discussion about the film and go into politics. However, one of the things that, uh, the, especially in the opening scenes with, um, with Margot's character is that, uh, you know, she learns her Holocaust denial from her, from her parents. Of course, in that script, and and of course things are you know there. That's one of the easier ways today. Obviously, you can you can be radicalized off of the internet, but sometimes it does start and come uh, from the home. Um, edu and, and yes, I would say that uh, that education uh, education is the way. You know, I I think this film does open that eye to, you know, that that paradigm of. You know the the aging uh, uh, person who was able to pass something on to the younger lost person um, has been used, uh, you know, lots of times. Sure. But um, I think that uh, that this film, in using, I guess, the whole the aging Holocaust survivor and uh, a Gentile child that was or teenager that was raised in a racist home you know, shifts that paradigm a little bit um, because it opens, you know, as Rafal says, it opens kind of like a different way to, uh, to redemption and, uh, and forgiveness. I, I wanted to ask, uh, I, I do want to ask Ed a couple of questions, but I do want to ask about the choice uh, for you and how maybe Helga and uh, Mark were involved uh, and also uh, Gina in that choice to, to use animation in the film. And what you what you right. were trying yeah. to do with what you were trying to do with that. And, sure, uh, sure. I'm gonna break in and say that I think that Margot's naivete was a big strength in her portrayal of that character and and really helped push the movie along. Mm -hmm. She was naive, mm -hmm. willing to open herself as she did. And it was made, made it a very powerful effect. Oh, it did. It did. You're absolutely right. Yeah, she was very much playing herself in a way. And that that was one of the things that, you know, made it so strong. 
and I, you know, I we were I was trying not to over direct her. I mean, we just did a couple of improvs and we didn't really do any rehearsals. I mean, there was no time and no money for rehearsals, but I just let her be, you know, who she is. And with Ed, she just became. And sometimes directing is more powerful when you, when you don't direct. You let it happen. How, how long was the and shoot? How long did you have for the shoot? Uh, we shot it in three weeks. Yeah, okay. three weeks. And, wow. you know, and the reason it took so long, because I insisted to have a 14-year-old actress. You know, the character is 14. Everyone kept on saying, no, 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 don't use a 14. It, it's, it would be a disaster. You know, you can only work with five hours with her by labor lows. But... Mm -hmm. You know, I really felt it was so important to have an authentic 14-year-old actress, not an 18-year-old. So that added an extra week of shooting. And it was always a race every day, you know, as the, as the five hours approached, you know, there was always a studio. There was always a studio teacher always on the set, you know, to make sure she was well protected. And she was always, you know, like, you know, and we kept on like sometimes just rolling the camera and getting different angles without cutting mm -hmm. the camera so she couldn't yell cut. You know, right. So, the, so we managed always to squeeze it till the very last second, and it was a race. Helga, were you involved in creating the animation? And I'm assuming Mark, you were you were involved in creating the music? Oh yeah, no, no, no. The animation. I'll explain. Uh, there was a, a in the last week of shooting, we noticed there was a costume assistant who had this diary, and I opened the diary, and I, it looked like Margot's diary, the character diary. So I said, we got to shoot this diary in the movie. We have to start putting in these drawings. So then we started injecting them into the movie and, and commissioned her to do drawings of tigers. And, the, and then my wife, who is an artist, took that and she started embellishing it. And she developed, you know, like hundreds of animations and drawings that we put into the movie. So it, it really was the, in, in the end was um, Clara and my wife who interpreted the inner life of this character and you gave it another dimension. But also it helped us because we could not afford to shoot the CGI tiger in the zoo in the end. So by having her as an artist, it enabled us to hopefully get that climactic moment in the end by drawings of the tiger. And I hope we achieved it. I know Gina would have loved us to spend you know, the money to do a real tiger <laughs> licking her hand and interacting with her. But... Um, the drawings saved us and, and gave it another dimension, you know, and I'm very grateful to, to have worked with my wife on it. She's a very talented artist and she's helped me and she was the production designer on half of the film as well. Well, well I would say, you know, that the, um, also the, uh, Mark, thank you, because also the music, I think that went along with those animations really were, were, were fitting also. Um, Gina, can I ask the, the, the title of the movie itself or the whole concept of the tiger, where did you come up with that? Um, gosh, I don't remember when I read, I read a bunch and somehow that thought, I think every um, culture has an image that they, I mean, in this instance, it was Chinese, the tiger. I mean, that's a true Chinese symbol for strength, but um I think every culture has some either reference or symbol or image that they um, refer to for their inner purity. And I thought, hmm, you know, that just, I don't know, it just came to me that sometimes when I feel weak or insecure or troubled, I remember that there is a force that, you, that people can tap into. And and it's, you know, it's, um, it's very fluid. I mean, as Ed said, who would have thought that Germany is our moral leader? Who would have thought that? And, you know, it's, uh, the world is fluid. I also, also just want to say something about Ed's family. Some days we ran out of actors. And Ed's daughter, which is one of my favorite scenes, because she did it so smoothly, was the teacher. And his granddaughter was the student in the... Um, in the classroom and it's just so great that you know when you're when you're just like generous people it's like oh you're actress didn't show okay i'll do it and she was great <laughs> you know you'd never know she uh you know she just picked up the lines and did it and um that's great so <laughs> it's 
that's where that's where the image I, so, you know i don't remember i could have read it 15 years ago i don't know it just came to me that this is what the movie is ultimately about right right no it, it fits and i wanted to ask uh um helga the the you know i was just thinking about it because the the scenes of of la that you showed um it was really very every day. Uh, and I mean that as a, as a compliment, you know, you, it wasn't, there was no emphasis on, on seedy Los Angeles or, or, or anything like that was, was, um, was the attempt to kind of show how normal the outside was, you know, uh, um, was that part of what you were trying to, to do? Because it helped with the focus on on uh, on Ed and Margot's characters, also. Yeah, I think Raphael had those conversations early on on what to focus on, and um, you know, we we were looking at locations, and um, they almost kind of uh, established themselves. You know, we we chose everything kind of based on the narrative and on on the characters and where they would best fit in. And, um, you know, some decisions were also made for us given the limited resources and, you know, and how, how that is in, in movies sometimes where, you know, you, you end up with something and it, the best thing that made it happen is, is an, a happy accident or it's a necessity of, hey, we didn't have this light or we didn't have the lens. and and that's how this magical shot came about. And so some of it was that where the locations fell into place because they, they felt right. And yeah, it wasn't, we didn't look for anything um, that would be, that would take away from the focus of, of the individual, of the, of the human element. Um, same. It's Go ahead. Right. Go ahead. And originally the script was set in New York, you know, and I always wanted to shoot it in New York because it's so gritty and so rich. And But in a way, now looking at it, that it's shot in sort of beautiful Southern California, it makes it more powerful because the characters really jump out stronger. I think mm -hmm. the city would have overwhelmed these two characters because right. you expect, you expect, you know, these characters in New York here in LA, they, they stand out more against the, you know, the the light, the golden right. light of California. Uh, but there was a concern, you know, will the golden light work versus the gritty dark light of New York for this story? And I think it actually worked even stronger. So we were very happy about that. Yeah. You know, and I always observed where teenage, you know, where runaway kids hang out in LA and where you see Holocaust survivors, you know, walking around in those places. So we tried to go back to those places in the movie. And um, yeah, and, um, and uh, you know, I'm so grateful to have the chance to have done this movie with, with Gina's beautiful script. And I hope that we are all spreading a positive message, you know, uh, no, I, I hope I, that. Yeah, I think you have, I think you have succeeded in that. I just, I, I wanna conclude by, by asking uh, everybody, maybe we'll start with, uh, with Ed, um, you know, maybe going back to that concept of, of embracing the tiger within. You know, um, Mr. Asner, you're, you're still a working actor. You're a young man of 91 and, a, and still a working actor. So what, is, what, is, uh, what does uh, um, embracing the tiger, after doing this movie, what does embracing the tiger mean to you? The lesson must constantly be found at home. Uh, we'll never stop learning the lesson. Look at the mass killings that we've experienced in America in the past week. It's sickening. And no lessons are being taught. No gun control is coming forth. What's happening in Myanmar? The uh, persecution of Muslims in Burma. And uh, there will be places in Africa that that same oppression occurred. The lessons will never be learned and must constantly be enforced, must be nationally empowered and thrust home. 
And uh, hopefully this film will make a tiny contribution to trying to learn that lesson. Well, sir, I think it does. And I, I, I think your performance does as well. Um, any, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll throw it up. And does anybody else in terms of, you know, after experiencing and working on this film, that, that concept of uh, redemption and forgiveness and, and embracing, I guess, embracing the tiger. What does that, uh, and Gina, you finally got this film made. So what does that mean for you now? Well, I'm delighted that it's made and particularly with Ed because um, it, it required somebody of great confidence. And the fact that Ed is known so worldwide for comedy, and this is not a comedy, and the restraint not to make it funny, because there's moments he could have been funny and he didn't, he under, you know, he just naturally understood the temperature all the way through. Um, what does it mean to me? If I could, you know, it's, it's that, that butterfly thing. If I could change one kid, one kid, that kid will change something. And, you know, just what happened yesterday in Georgia kills me. It kills me. Not as, yes, I am a Democrat, but not because of that. The weakness of the Republican Party at the moment in Georgia, I don't understand it. And it's, it's, it's that same blindness that leads to all the atrocities. And a lot of times I have been asked by dumb, dumb people, even if they've gone to college, even Ivy's, you know, well, what makes the Holocaust so much worse than other, you know, and they bring these things up, you know, uh, whether it's Khmer Rouge or whatever, right? And the death, one death is as horrific as another death. But we, ex I don't expect that much from a 12 year old boy being forced to carry a gun or a 10 year old that's gonna get shot if he doesn't obey. I expect more from learned men. And that is what my answer is. And so if this film can educate one person to challenge their uneducated people, you know, their uneducated parents, I mean, to have a dialogue or even an argument, like mom, Jews don't have horns. Oh yes, they do, Sonny, you know, no, they don't. You know, if, if I can do that to one kid, that, that would be, um, my other movies, my goal was to make them laugh and to, you know, I mostly do romantic comedies and I'm very delighted with them. But this, I don't think they're gonna change anyone's life. I want to impact the hatred. Oh, yeah. well, we thank That's you awesome. for that. Yeah. Um, anybody else? Well, you know, to me, just embracing the tiger means just in life, you know, do what's important, have the courage mm -hmm. to do. I, I, I I'm so, feel so grateful I made this film because I felt it was important, you know, and I had to finance it myself, actually. I mean, I took a huge risk and I may never recover it, but the message was just so powerful that it's beyond money. So I think in life, it's more important to do things that you care about. And sometimes you have to put aside, you know, the lesser things and have the courage to do that because that's all that you're left with in the end. Well, I think, you know, that's, Margot's that's character, the, what, she, what she learns is, is that living uh, is embracing living a purposeful life. You know, she gets over the hate or the, the it's not even hate, it's really the ignorance and she embraces the purposeful yeah. life. Yeah. Um, I think Helga, you had uh, your hand yeah. up. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, um, getting the message out and being part of it in general um, for me also was meaningful because I uh, was born and raised in Germany. So um, my emphasis um, of history growing up, being taught and in school, you know, of obviously um, the Holocaust and this very theme was extremely strong. I mean, it's, you know, you grow up with it every day and taught it as to never forget and, and uh, keep it as a lesson of history and life. And um, so 
it was um, you know powerful to be, to be part of. And I think the main object was for me to get the message out and also do it with the film, which is my medium. And it's I think it's a beautiful mm -hmm. medium to do that with because you can reach people uh, in in many different ways. Um, and avenues, kind of what Gina said, you know, if, if there's one person we can reach that watches a movie, everybody watches movie, most people love watching movies. And if there's one person we can reach, I think the, the goal has been, has been fulfilled. Wonderful, wonderful. So if, I may, if, if I may just add my little word is, uh, I think one of the great things about this film is that between the acting performance uh, of Ed Asner and, and the young actress, and the way it was shot, it has it it's a it seems to demystify the challenge of forgiving, of moving on, of what is there called embracing the tiger, which is to actually uh, we we tend to think of this as something so challenging and difficult and and impossible to overcome, and here you have this man who just carries this life and has distilled it to a moment of forgiveness and he manages to bring that to this girl and he communicates it successfully because she is transformed by it mm -hmm. and that happens in the simplest of ways with no fanfare with no right. with no it's a, it's on a human level it never becomes a superhero and it doesn't look like a superhero it looks like two people who whose paths crossed and that exchange can happen with, with the tools of the regular human. And right. I, thought, I thought that was a very universal and encouraging. That's a good point. I never thought of it that way. Yeah. yeah. yeah well, Gina, that's your, it's your himself. butterfly effect. That's your butterfly effect. Yeah. That's what yeah. Mark was saying. But yeah. uh, anyway, uh, I do want to thank you. Um, it was thank such, such a I'm pleasure. I, I do really appreciate it. Thank um, you, Jim. Uh, thank you, Gina, for for your for uh, for writing it, and Rafael for uh, directing you. it, and Mark for your score, and Helga for uh, the cinematography, and and most especially uh, Mr. Asner. And it was truly, truly a pleasure, uh, even though this is through the screen, uh, meeting you, and uh, and hearing your comments. And uh, I hope I wish everybody continued success in their career, and uh, I hope this movie does uh, continue to. Uh, to resonate with everybody that watches it. So thank you on behalf of the Miami Jewish Film Festival. Thank you. Much thank you. We're so grateful. So grateful okay. to be part of this. Thank you. Goodbye, everybody. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.